At this point, we're going to hear from our first keynote speakers, Jessica Thornton and Heather Russick from Evergreen and Ryerson Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, respectively. Their presentation is themed Strange Ideas About the Future of Employment. Jessica Thornton is the lead author of Turn and Face the Strange and the director of strategic initiatives at Evergreen. She uses creative problem solving around human-centered design, strategic foresight, and design research methods to advance innovation policy. Jessica has spent nearly a decade tackling issues such as housing affordability, transportation accessibility, and sustainable food system development. Formerly at Ryerson Brookfield Institute, she was responsible for leading several major projects including Employment in 2030 and Digitally Lit. Heather Russack has spent the last 10 plus years working on large scale initiatives and more recently on applying human centered design as Director of Policy Innovation at Ryerson Brookfield Institute. Heather provides strategic direction to the day to day operations of the institution's policy innovation platform and sparking partnerships across sectors. Heather believes that using novel methodologies to engage people will enable policy innovation and is testing new models of collaboration and innovation at Brookfield Institute. Please give a warm Hamilton welcome to Jessica and Heather. Well, here is a mango. Anybody have mango in the past week? Any mango fans out there? Great. So this is actually a mango from the future. So what if I told you this mango was grown here in Canada? What if it was the product of out of service oil sands that have been converted into greenhouses? What if climate change refugees from the Caribbean settled in places like Fort McMurray because it was the most affordable place to live? And they worked in these greenhouses where they experimented with growing their favorite fruits from back home. What if it just so happened that it was warm enough with the right advances in growing technologies that they were successful? What if we had Fort McMurray Fresh mangoes? It is May 16th, 2030, and I just applied for a job as a marketing manager. Instead of submitting my cover letter and resume, I applied for this job through the platform HireMe. This platform uses my digital identity to determine my employability for the position. This score isn't looking so great though, so I'm not sure if I'm gonna get this job. The score is based on my social media, LinkedIn, previous employers, police records, and any surveillance data that exists about me. Right now, this platform is tracking how polite I have been in my day-to-day -day interactions. But thankfully, this part of the analysis has been positive. So I'm running to my next meeting, and I pull out my smartphone and say, hey Siri, where am I supposed to be going? Only to be met with this alert letting me know that I had been blocked from using Siri for a few times because it just so happened I might have sworn at my smartphone a few too many times in the past week. Just so happens the next couple of days will be a little bit complicated for me given that this is how I pay for things, order my groceries, know where I'm supposed to be. I suppose I should have been a bit more polite like Heather over here. Thank you so much for having us here today. I was a student at McMaster, McMaster University a number of years ago now so it's nice to be in Hamilton today. Um, my name is Heather Resick, and I love to learn about a lot of different things, and I think that's why the study of futures is so appealing to me. And I'm Jessica Thornton. Um, I'm a collaborator at the Brookfield Institute and also a director at Evergreen, where I'm working on some new projects exploring the future of cities. We just shared three things from the future to help spark your imagination today. By raising your hands, do you think these things will come true by 2030? Okay. Great. The reason we're here today is because Jessica and I and our co another co-author, Tara O'Neill, were fortunate enough to work on a report that we released earlier this year for the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Our report called Turn and Face the Strange highlights key trends impacting the future of work over the next 10 to 15 years. The Brookfield Institute is a policy-focused institute housed at Ryerson University in Toronto. We generate far-sighted insights and stimulate new thinking to advance actionable innovation policy in Canada. And we do this through research, experimentation, and piloting. And at the Brookfield Institute, we focus our efforts on four major work streams. We're, the, the report we're gonna talk about today falls our, under our skills for an innovation-driven economy work stream. But if you're interested in learning more about the other work we have under, uh, underway, feel free to visit our website or join our mailing list to receive updates. Now normally people, when they think about the future, they look at the past. People look at historical information and extrapolate that forward as if nothing will change. These are population estimates from Statistics Canada and they're definitely helpful. The dotted lines try to tell us how demographics might change over time. 
But there are a number other of other things that we need to consider when we think about the future. Because we need to remember that no one can predict the future, because the future isn't here yet. So Jessica and I like to refer to this quote to help us remind us and think about the future. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. There are many small examples or signals of change that indicate what might be possible in the future, but they're not mainstream, at least not yet. So ideas that seem wild today may not be so wild in the future, and ideas that seem certain today may become obsolete in a short period of time. We like to think about the range of possible futures on the horizon. This is the cone of possibility. What it really tells us is that there's a range of possible futures. We can think about five years from now, and there are a number of possible futures we can think about, but there's also a number of uncertainties. If we think about 50 years from now, there's likely infinite possible futures we can think about. This is also important to consider when thinking about the future of Hamilton. There's likely many possible futures that you could talk about today, and you likely want to talk about your most preferred or desirable future, but there's also probable and possible futures that you can think about. This starts to get a little overwhelming when you think about all the possibilities, but thankfully, there is a methodology to help us with this process. So one of which is something called a horizon scan. So a horizon scan is a methodology of part of a broader field of study of strategic foresight that Heather was just chatting a little bit about that helps you understand what the broad range of changes on the horizon are that could impact any given topic. So let me explain that a bit more so it's a bit more specific. And so to do this method, what you do is you scan broadly. You look at academic sources, popular media, fringe sources, social media, anywhere that tells you different pockets of evidence to suggest there's a signal of change with the potential to impact any area that you're studying. And so once you identify all those signals, you can then distill them down into trends to say that here is a change that is coming together and could impact this any given topic. And so for our research in Turn and Face the Strange, we scanned broadly. We looked at over a thousand different sources where we identified 600 signals of change that were telling us potential changes on the horizon that could impact the future of Canada's labor market. From those 600 signals, we distilled them down into 100 trends and then to 31, which we thought were most relevant to the broader research study that this report is part of. Of those 31 trends, they range in maturity. So there are some that are quite mature that will not be surprising to anybody in this room. There's also a range of emerging trends, and these are exactly that, they're emerging. They have a growing number of pieces of evidence to suggest that there's a trend here that we should pay attention to. And then there's a third category, which are our personal favorites, and those are weak signals. These are exactly that, they're weak. They are almost pre-trends, if you will. These are different pieces of evidence that suggest that there could be change, but they're very uncertain. And so today, we're going to share 13 of the trends that we identified in this broader study, and they range from mature to some of the weak signals, which are often the ones that you really want to think about if you want to prepare for the range of possible futures on the horizon. So the first trend I'm going to talk about today is creative AI. So often when we think about creativity, we see it as one of the most innately human skills. But will that be the case in the future? So this past year, Christie's sold the first ever AI-created painting at auction that was created by three French students using borrowed code. Meanwhile, a couple of years ago, the Cannes Films Festival aired the first ever AI-created script film. Would it surprise you to know that it was a sci-fi film? So are these creative outputs that are being generated by artificial intelligence, AI, as good as what a human can create? Absolutely not. Definitely not making that case. But given the amount of investment in this area, given how many companies are pouring research and dollars into improving it, will that be the case in the future? So when we think about, and at the Brookfield Institute, a lot of research is done to understand which different occupations will be impacted by automation, we often say that those that are related to creative tasks will be the most resilient. But if we have improvements in this area, how might that change? Conversely, how might creative services become more affordable, something that the every, every, all of us can have interior designers, portrait photographers, how might our worlds actually become more creative as we have more of it access to the service and it pushes humans to get even better? I'm going to talk about one of our demographics trends. Do you imagine yourself living to be 100 years old? 
It is common knowledge that we have an aging population in Canada, but what is less common is that people turning 100, or centenarians, is actually the fastest growing demographic group. Now this sounds great, doesn't it? We can all live a very long time, but according to the World Economic Forum white paper, we may not be able to afford to live that long. It is the financial burden of a very long retirement that might impact our working age in the future. We are already, we are already seeing this with our latest census, where 50% of men aged 65 are still working. And in the US, senior citizens are replacing teenagers as fast food workers. This is likely to be even more pronounced for younger people, because according to the National Institute for Retirement Security, 66% of people between 21 and 32 have absolutely nothing saved for retirement. So what might this mean in the future? Maybe it won't make sense to have an age, a retirement age of 65 in the future. Perhaps we will all adjust to a new reality where we work well into our 80s and 90s. Are you ready for that? This next trend is one of our weak signals that we present in our research. It's called Humans Augmented. Now, it is definitely one of my favorite trends. I love to talk about this one, and I probably talk about it so much, I'm starting, try, starting to sound like a crazy futurist. It is about an idea that definitely seems wild today, but may not be so wild in the future. There are four very interesting signals telling us that brain enhancements may become a reality. There is a startup in the United States called Kernel that is developing a neural prosthetic to connect our minds and bodies with machine interfaces. There's, Elon Musk is actually creating a product where you can connect your brains with your smartphones. And his company called Neuralink is planning to start clinical trials in 2020, which is quite soon. The third signal that's interesting related to this trend is that scientists have developed something called BrainNet to let three people enable them to share their thoughts with each other. And then finally, there's research underway in the growing field of sensory enhancement. So in the future, we might have an additional sense of telepathy. Now this definitely sounds like the stuff of science fiction, but we imagine that this might impact the future of work in a number of ways. Will this be the way that we learn new skills or process information in the future? This will definitely be beneficial to support working retirement, likely. But it obviously it been, brings up a ton of questions, and according to Pew Research, 66% of Americans definitely or probably would not want a brain chip to improve their ability to process information. But will this still be true 10 years from now? Or is it more likely that this becomes a benefit provided by our employers to improve our productivity? So 50% of Canadians under the age of 45 will experience a mental health challenge at least once in their life. Is it any wonder that sick days in Canada are on a steady increase in recent years? 51 billion is estimated to be the total economic burden of mental health annually in Canada, according to CAMH. So there's many things driving the increase in mental health challenges in Canada, but one is certainly related to our use of technology. So a recent Berkeley study found that 50% of teens who were using smartphones for five hours or more had contemplated, planned, or attempted suicide at least once, in comparison to 28% who are only on smartphones for one hour a day. This is an incredibly concerning statistic. And while we've never been more connected than ever before because of social media, young people aged 16 to 24 are reportedly young, more lonely than any other demographic group. So as mental health challenges have been on the steady rise in places all over Canada and the world, arguably, we're starting to see interesting new solutions and responses. So for example, down in Arkansas, there is a group of barbers who are being trained to provide mental health supports to their clients. So you can go in, you can get a haircut, maybe get your beard cleaned up, and you can talk about what's on your mind. It's an interesting new approach. Meanwhile, researchers at MIT have been developing neuro networks that are capable of detecting anxiety and depression and stress in everyday conversations. So you could be having a conversation over here and you could know that this person needs additional support. So what could this look like in the future? Might we need more professions who are trained to provide mental health services? I think we're already starting to see that as we take managers and senior managers being asked to take this seriously. But what other professions will start to move into this area? Conversely, 
as we have more networks able, able of detecting our mental health, how will we all have our individualized mental health scores and data? How might that be used to determine what, what new tasks we can take on in our workplace? Regardless of what the future holds, this is one of our mature trends and one that I think many of us are already thinking about and paying attention to. And if employers don't take it serious, they'll definitely see a productivity loss in future years. And this relates to this next trend we're going to talk about, digital detox. So every single Canadian under the age of 45 uses the internet at least an hour every day. And for many of us, it's more than an hour. It's pretty consistent, especially if you're required to be online for work. But is this good for us? Well, the previous trend would suggest that perhaps there's some challenges here. And in fact, researchers recently discovered that social media addiction was similar in its symptoms to alcoholism and smoking. And so we know it's not good for us, and many of us are really starting to question and consider our technology use. In fact, in the UK, 34% of residents are actively seeking time offline, something that's further supported by the UK having a national unplugging day. Meanwhile, we've got celebrities, and I think other people, starting to opt for dumb phones, which is basically a flip phone, something without all the connectivity apps. Who hasn't considered trading in their iPhone now and again? I know I certainly have. So what could this mean in the future? Well, might it be that we have more demand for experiences, disconnected experiences, opportunities for tourism, opportunities for places with lots of waterfalls, perhaps? How might we need more Wi-Fi free zones? We right now think about Wi-Fi free cafes. Maybe we'll need entire areas that offer people the opportunity to disconnect. Regardless of what the future holds, this is one that's interesting because for many of us, we don't have the privilege of disconnecting. We're required to be online because of work. Although we're starting to see some countries such as France who are giving employees the legal right to disconnect from work email during non-work hours. So it'll be interesting to see how this changes. I'm sure it is not news for anyone in this room that energy has become one of the most valuable and important resources of our time. We need energy for our computers, our devices, and related infrastructure. And I'm sure it's also not news that there's been a ton of development into renewable sources of energy, like wind and solar technology. We're about 14 years away from having solar technology be able to meet our energy demands of today, which is great news. But it's also a long way off, given how important energy is for technology development today. And that is likely why we continue to see significant research and development into finding other sources of energy. Canadian companies are investing $18.1 billion each year for in-house energy research and development. And there are scientists that have been developing other sources of energy like artificial photosynthesis devices that are able to absorb more sunlight, or bacteria-packed solar cells that are able to absorb sunlight even on cloudy days. This seems really optimistic and a great, great progress in this direction. And it may mean that the cost of energy production reduces in the future. Perhaps the cost of energy production will get, go down to almost zero. This is likely great news for the tech community and is also great news for households across the country. And we see this Im impacting and reinforcing the other technology trends that we talk about in our research. 14% of Canadians are involved in early entrepreneurship activities. And if we expand the definition of entrepreneurship to also include independent contractors, freelancers, and gig workers, this number goes way up. Intuit Canada predicts that almost 50% of the Canadian workforce will make up this group next year. This is a ton of people, and so we see the demand for entrepreneurship growing over time, likely given our desire for control, autonomy, and flexibility in our work, and also because of the positive media presence of TV shows like Dragon's Den. Younger generations are particularly interested in entrepreneurship. The founder of a, of a tutoring company in the United States that coaches teens on preparing for the SAT says Gen Z is particularly interested in entrepreneurship, even more so than traditional occupations, like being a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer. So we imagine this might mean entrepreneurship grows over time, and perhaps becomes our dominant career path. And rather than committing to a single employer, we create our own opportunities. And perhaps this comes with it a shift in our mindset. So instead of being focused on loyalty and job security, we actually focus on freedom and choice. Now this sounds amazing, it definitely sounds amazing to me, but there are a number of drawbacks that go along with this trend. 
who will support all of the precarious workers in the future if employers are not providing health benefits and supports? How will governments respond with new policies and programs? In the United States, there was new legislation introduced to actually support gig workers and help them provide, get better access to mortgages by accepting alternative sources of income. Workers will likely demand fair and equitable pay over time as this trend becomes more mature. But there are also a number of signals that point to this trend perhaps not developing in the way that we expect. People are starting to demand four-day work weeks and as well put boundaries around their time and really not accepting that they need to work evenings and weekends to keep up with their job responsibilities. So whether entrepreneurship grows or not, we likely see a growth in the need for an entrepreneurial mindset and the skills associated with entrepreneurship. So this will likely mean that educational offerings develop over time to support developing entrepreneurial skills. And perhaps this means in the future that instead of parents taking their kids to soccer practice every week, perhaps they take them to entrepreneurship programs instead. So between 200 million and 1 billion people will be forced to flee their home by the year 2050 due to climate, crisis, and disaster. Already, 22.5 million people are forced to flee their home due to climate change impacts, forest fires, floods, that type of thing, according to the UN. So according to a researcher at the University of Waterloo, Canada might see up to 100 million people flee here due to climate change impacts. We're already starting to see more and more people moving north in places like Guatemala and El Salvador. But currently, climate sits outside of the legal definition of what a refugee is. But will that need to change in the future if this is actually the number one reason why people are forced to flee their home? So interestingly, New Zealand experimented with the idea of a visa program for climate refugees, starting to explore what that idea could look like. But realistically speaking, we do know there's concerns around immigration, around border security, so maybe not everyone's ready to change this definition. But what if we did? What if Canada took a leadership role and said, we are going to accept this is one of the criteria for us welcoming people into this country? How might we change? How might having a significant, a more significant, perhaps the most significant proportion of our population with lived experience related to responding to the climate crisis actually spur innovation? How might we become leaders in the green economy in coming up with the most innovative responses to climate change because we have the most lived experience here? And as we know, a lot of entrepreneurship does come from lived experience. How might this growth actually help us meet our future labor demands? And how might our everyday change and our, our investments in sustainability change if we've really taken this as such a serious commitment? It's an interesting one to keep an eye out and one that's very much growing in conversation since we first did this research. So this next trend is one of my personal favorites. It's one we classify as a weak signal, but I have to say since we finished our final draft uh, almost a year ago, this is one that's really grown in conversations. So personal data ownership, or more specifically, the monetization of our personal data, is a growing concern amongst many Canadians. Related to data privacy concerns, this specific trend is looking at how new models of ownership and governance have been emerging in recent years. So I'll give you a couple examples. In Zurich, there is a data cooperative called Mind Data that was formed to allow their members to have control over how their data is used. More locally in Toronto, there's a startup called Delphia that is exploring how they can actually compensate their users for their data. Can you imagine? Instead of free. In the UK, the first ever data trust was opened this past year that is specifically formed for, to provide third-party governance over data related to transportation, biodiversity, and other city-related topics, something that's also being explored in Toronto with the Sidewalk Labs project. So what will the future hold? As our concern for our data use grows and grows and grows, I think it will really push us to reconsider the current relationship. I think it'll push data reliant companies who are currently perhaps getting our data for free to be pushed to really consider that. And so will we all get paid for every like and share and check in we do? Potentially not. But will the way that our data is governed and how we think about that drastically change in the future? it already is, so this is an interesting one. And we'll see if this week's signal matures. There is a shift underway to make gender equality a reality. With the Me Too movement, the Women's March, 
and record number of women holding public office, feminism is really reaching a new level of prominence. People are challenging the current systems of power with zero tolerance for inappropriate behavior by powerful men. Yet, we are still seeing social norms and structures related to gender differences in relation to our careers and workplaces. The World Economic Forum Global Gender Index for Canada has basically not improved since 2006. We do really well in terms of health and educational attainment, with, the majority, with women making up the majority of students on campuses across the country. But we're falling behind in terms of economic progress and women's representation in leadership. Full-time working women earn 75 cents for every dollar earned by a man, and this gets even worse for women of color who earn 33% less than men. So how, if we think broadly about how this trend might play out in the future, what could it look like? Will it be possible that the majority of women attaining post-secondary certifications translated into the majority of CEOs being female? What if there were as many women as heads of state as men? How might our world look different? And today we painted a picture where we work well into our 80s and 90s, which again is hard for me to imagine myself, but work well into our 80s and 90s and where our careers change consistently over time. And in this world, we imagine that lifelong learning will be critical to keep up. We imagine that learning never stops. And we are already seeing this with the type of educational offerings that are emerging. So instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, we see self-directed learning and micro-credentialing, such as digital badges. An example of a targeted educational opportunity exists with the Shopify Carleton Dev degree. So you're able to go and get your computer science degree and get paid to do it through the company. But imagine if this also existed for other disciplines. And imagine this existed for people not just transitioning to, from high school, but also for people throughout their long careers. We're also seeing a shift in the way we think about post-secondary education and really starting to see that maybe it will be perceived as being less valuable over time. Because companies like IBM, Apple, and Google are no longer requiring job applicants to hold a degree. So this might mean that there are a ton of new learning opportunities that present themselves for people between the ages of 18 and 100 plus. And when I think about this trend in relation to my own life, I wonder what my own daughter will choose 10 years from now when she is 18 years old. Will she choose an employer-based degree, or will she choose a traditional educational institute, institution? Or perhaps she'll choose something that hasn't even been designed yet to support lifelong learning. So as we continue to learn and learn and learn throughout our entire lives, uh, where might we live? Well, 50% of today's global population lives in cities. This is a number that's expected to increase to 70% in the coming years. 98% of Canada's economic growth happens in urban areas. Our urban areas are very important. In fact, many, many Canadians are vying to live close to where their employment op opportunities exist. And this, according to a McGill professor, is pushing some housing affordability challenges and pushing many people to move to suburban areas. In fact, the population in Canada's suburban areas is growing faster than the overall population of Canada itself. So what could this mean in the future? If more and more of us are living in suburbs while our work is in downtown areas, what could that look like? Yes, we're probably talking about more and more telecommuting, but what else? How will it actually transform our suburban areas? How might our suburban areas actually become the hotspots? How might Ajax become the new trendy Brooklyn? I think it's an interesting idea to think about as we live where we can afford to live, how that might push us to transform about what we think about these, these, these places and these spaces. And that brings us to our last trend. So the future of work is strategy, imagination, and creativity, according to the Harvard Business Review. And we're back to the topic of creativity. So now I'm going to counter what I said earlier and argue that the future of human work is very much connected to our ability to be creative. So according to a recent survey done by Adobe and Forrester Consulting, 82% of companies surveyed linked strong business results and outcomes to their ability to be creative. So we're now moving beyond this idea that some of us are creative and some of us are not. We all need to be creative. I think we heard that a little bit in the presentation just before us. And so I ask you, is this something that we can learn? Well, does this work that we've presented seem creative to you? It takes a lot of imagination to actually think about what the future could hold. But five years ago, my mentor told me I was not creative at all and I needed to go and learn it. 
And so I did. So I went to OCAD and I got a Master's of Design where I learned how to become a human-centered designer. But not all of us have time to go and do a Master's, even though it's part-time and I highly recommend it. But happily, there's this new thing called creativity gyms. That's right. Instead of going and working out your biceps, you can work out your creative biceps, I guess. This is an idea created by Stanford D School that was designed specifically for white collar workers to develop this very important skill. And we see this as a huge opportunity as we think about how do we support creativity? How do we all become creative problem solvers? And so maybe in the future, instead of the most innovative office places having ping pong tables and free snacks, they have play studios, watercolor studios, who knows? What could this look like? Sounds like a pretty great place to work. And speaking of creativity, we always like to give a shout out to the amazing illustrator who brought our trends to life. She's fantastic, highly recommend her. So we have just shared 13 of the 31 trends that we identified in our report, and you're welcome to read about the other ones that we published as well. But when you're thinking about the future, there are many ways that we can expect change to occur, but there's also many unexpected changes. So we really encourage you to think beyond the technology changes that we talk about in our work, and also think about the social and cultural changes that are also happening at the same time. We also encourage you to think about the tension that exists between the trends. We talked about the tension between creative AI and mandatory creativity. We also highlighted the tension that exists between technology development, and in particular, the potential for brain implants, but there's also a growing desire for digital detox. By thinking broadly about these potential changes, you can create and test strategies against these possibilities. And we encourage you to test some of your assumptions against our wild ideas. For example, will it be mainstream in the future that employers no longer require university education? Or will it become mainstream that workers are no longer willing to sit in front of a computer screen all day because they've adopted a digital detox? When you're thinking about all these changes, please consider, and I know you're here today to talk about your most preferred future for Hamilton, but there's also many other futures that you can talk about. So please think about this when you're thinking about the next 10 to 20 years. And so we've shared with you a few of the signals that we identified through our research, and I'm sure it probably sparked for you a few signals that are more relevant to your experience here. And once you start looking for signals, I promise you, you won't be able to stop. These are just a few of the signals we've been thinking about since publishing um, a few months ago. And so pay attention to the signals, especially the weak ones. We, I can't encourage this enough. Things that seem wild today will not be wild tomorrow. And in preparing and thinking about the consequences and thinking about your preferred response to that, you will actually be prepared and helping to contribute towards the future that you hope for Hamilton. So thank you so much. Um, our final report related to this broader piece of uh, research will be available in early 2020, so stay in touch. <laughs>